Yeah, so I'm here today to talk about uh, Take and Go to bring a pinball machine back to life. Uh, my name is Jeremy Flights. Um, I've been a Go developer since 2016. I am currently doing uh, Go and Kubernetes at Conceal, like Eric was mentioning. I uh, work with an amazing engineering team there. Uh, I love doing side projects. And uh, I've been in the pinball hobby for now crazily over 30 years, which I can't believe that. But uh, pinball always has these like, awesome side projects you can do. Uh, open source hardware, like doing circuit board designs, uh, 3D printing. Uh, even during the pandemic here, uh, back in 2020, I even took a Wizard of Oz pinball machine, used some amazing packaging tape capabilities here to put a camera on top of a mic stand, and uh, wrote uh, a quick little Go app with React so you can do remote control pinball. So that way everybody that's on a Zoom in the, anywhere in the United States can play a pinball machine with a, a massive amount of delay. Uh, this, it's pretty funny watching the ball, like somebody tried to hit a flipper and then the ball just already, already fell down. Um, so, to first start off, we're going to talk about the anatomy of a pinball machine. Uh, this whole entire talk is going to start from the ground up, and at the very end, we're going to get into the actual game rules themselves. Uh, the pinball machine that uh, is inside this talk was made in 1982, so this is going to be some older type of technology that we're going to first be interfacing with. Um, starting with the inside the cabinet, uh, there is a tilt mechanism uh, that's located on the bottom right there with a little plunge, like a little uh, actuary that, that hangs down, and if it hits the side, that's, that's how you, you tilted the game. Uh, there's also a ball that, that if you nudge it really hard, it hits a switch in the very front. Uh, and then there's a picture of the coin door, and really the coin door is just important because there's a little tiny diagnostic switch inside there, so that way you can test solenoids, lamps, sounds, and things like that. Um, the back of the, the uh, pinball machine is where all the electronics are stored. Uh, and like I said, this is 1980s, so um, there is going to be uh, uh, some things you just have to you know, interface with, and I'm going to end up using a Raspberry Pi to replace that middle board there, uh, which, which is the MPU. Um, finally, you have the play field. And this is the bottom of the play field here, uh, where you'll see uh, the switches, the lamps, and the solenoids that we have to interface with. So now, going back into the electronics, every pinball manufacturer just has their own different flavor of boards uh, and their own different type of architecture. Um, this, this one is made by Game Plan. Um, and just, go, just quickly going through each one of these things, um, the solenoid driver board itself is a TTL interface, uh, four bits, and then you also have two ad address lines inside it to control those two relays at the bottom. Uh, the relays themselves, one will turn on the flippers, and the other one is used for an accessory. Uh, the lamp driver board is very similar to the solenoid uh, driver board, except there's 64 uh, silicon control rectifiers. Uh, they're all multiplexed, uh, once again using TTL, uh, into four different uh, 4 by 16 banks. Uh, so basically you have four enables and four bits, total of eight bits, and you're able to control 64 lamps. The soundboard itself is a Motorola um, 6800, and it just plays some amazing you know, chip tune type of uh, action. Um, and then finally we have the displays, and the displays here are actually was a little bit tricky to actually interface because uh, they're, they're seven segment displays, but you turn on each digit uh, one at a time and you have to go fast enough, so that way it's in, in a polling fashion just to make sure that it, you see the whole entire score at the same time instead of just one digit at a time. Uh, finally, back to that MPU board. Uh, the MPU board is the brain. Uh, this was a Z80 based system originally. Uh, on the left, that's the original board. On the right, that's one of my open source hardware projects. Uh, I remade, a, remade it using some newer uh, uh, ICs, um, and it's, it's up on GitHub. People can uh, make it themselves and, and start bringing some machines back to life. Um, so this is where we're going to take uh, the MPU and, and replace this with a Raspberry Pi. Um, so now, as far as the pinball machine itself, it's called Mike Bossy. Um, it was never manufactured. There was only one that was made for an AMOA trade show back in 1982. Uh, and I, I, like I said, I've been collecting pinball for a long time and I actually found a populated play field as well as one backlass. Um, there's actually two backlasses in there, um, but I found just the one with the big Mike Bossy forehead looking, at, looking over you, which is you know, kind of taunting. Um, so I, I did put this together and uh, back in 2006 and I brought it to Chicago Pinball Expo. Uh, Big pinball hero, Roger Sharp, he played it, and he, and he told me, he's like, you know, I remember playing this game back in 1982, and um, it wasn't that great. And uh, actually, I remember the goalie moving back and forth, and your, your goalie doesn't move. And also, there's, there's another backlash that goes in front of that. And 
so he's like, but I do remember writing an article about it, and let me, let me send it to you. So he sent me this, and I read it, and it, it, was, it was terrible. Um, everything that, like just some quotes that were taken out of here, that last one just about uh, if it's a case of trial and error, the latter one out. So the way I look at it is it's setting a low bar. I can't do any worse, it sounds like. Um, so this is where GoFlip's going to come in. Uh, at first, starting off with the, with the controller, I just used this uh, Raspberry Pi 3. Um, and uh, for the peripherals, I'm using Arduino Nanos that are connected by uh, the USB just doing the serial communications. Um, finally, I'm using uh, I2C uh, to go to what's called a PCA 9685 uh, IC. And it's really made for uh, doing the, um, the LED uh, lights um, for you know, the, the RGB lights. Um, but you can also use it for doing pulse width modulation to control an RC servo. Um, the last part of that, I'm using three 8-bit shift registers uh, connected to the GPIO inside the Raspberry Pi. And this allows for you to have three 8-bit parallel ports instead of just single addressable uh, pins. So now we're going to get into the hardware abstraction uh, for the programming. And this is, this is exactly what GoFlip is, is intended to do. So that way, someone that's programming the game doesn't have to really be concerned about how to do the actual hardware interfacing it's, itself. Um, so each, each uh, in GoFlip, it does have all the separate Go routines that are running. Um, it does include all the hardware references. It keeps track of all the hardware state that's going on. Uh, but then it also has the player state and the game state as well. Um, the most important part of this is it is a singleton object inside the, the package. So that way, if someone does, on the, on the game level, try to create another GoFlip instance, it just gets the one single instance. That way, you don't have two GoFlip instances trying to compete over who's, tr who's uh, controlling the hardware. Um, as far as the LAMP control goes, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's just a, a Go routine that's constantly running. It's looking for a, a message that's coming in. And the message will uh, basically uh, it, it has like some very, uh, it just basically just takes whatever the message is coming in and then sends it over to the Arduino using the send message. Uh, send message is just a three byte array and then it just puts it into the, in, into the array and then sends it over to, uh, through the USB connection. Uh, the solenoid control is very similar. Uh, the only difference here is there is a send short message. Uh, this is just a one byte message so it, does, it is uh, able to go a little bit faster. And in order to get into the, 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 the proper place for the, uh, the device ID, I'm basically just doing a bitwise shift uh, based upon the command size. Uh, in this case, I'm passing a three in there. Um, and so I'm just really just shifting it over three. And then I'm just using uh, a mask just to, on the lower three bits, uh, the, the 0, 7, D, uh, with the value, just so adding it all together is just that one byte message. Um, as mentioned, as mentioned uh, before, uh, solenoids are very high current, and um, <laughs> if you keep them on too long, uh, they actually will start burning up. And this is actually why I, st I actually started with the lamp driver first, because if you have a lamp on for too long, it doesn't really matter, it's just, it's just on. But with a solenoid, if it gets locked up, it, it will actually start smoking. It has this nice electronic smell that everybody just loves to, 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 uh, to, to smell. <laughs> Um, so the one important part about the solenoid subscriber is there is a timeout that, that goes on, and it's called a keep alive. And this basically is just telling it from GoFlip to the Arduino that, hey, I'm still here. I just don't have anything to do. And the reason why that's important is so that in the Arduino, it, it has uh, what's called a watchdog. And if it's not getting anything uh, from, from the host, it'll actually do a reset and try to readjust re, uh, communications. So that way, it doesn't keep a solenoid that's, that's on longer than it was really supposed to. Now, there are relays and some other solenoids that are designed to be on for a long time. Uh, so you, you're able to, you, you are able to do that. Um, as far as what uh, I did make a, 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 a call to always call it solenoid always on instead of just solenoid on, just so from a game developer, you really have to make that decision if you really want to keep it on or not, um, instead of just calling it solenoid on. OK, finally, uh, the back to the servo. So I'm using an RC servo to make this goalie move back and forth that Roger was talking about. And in order to do this, uh, I, I once again use that little, um, I'm just using I2C from the Raspberry Pi, and it controls the servo. So uh, the I, for, for doing I2C, um, you can use I2C detect just to find uh, what, uh, what I2C device is connected to the Raspberry Pi. 
Uh, and then you can use that as the, the message going into um, the I2C struct. Um, there's a, also in the server options there, you're, you're setting the, the arc range, which is the, co the complete amount of range that you want the servo to move from. Uh, and then also the min and max pulse, which is inside microseconds. So it's, yeah, 500 microseconds is the small pulse. 2,500 microseconds is, the, is the, the, the largest pulse that you send uh, inside to the servo. Finally, we're getting into the, uh, the, the ship registers, and this is what's going to be used to control the displays. Um, now, I, I use KiCad for doing all my uh, circuit boards. Um, it's, you know, once again, it's open source and free. Uh, and what this allows for you to do is just take three pins inside the Raspberry Pi, data clock and latch, and able to drive those, uh, those digits uh, for port A, port B, port C. And then the high nibble of port C is also what's going to be interfaced to the soundboard. Um, this is what it looks like in Go to uh, actually do the shift register uh, work. And if you notice, um, you know, first it's taking that third register and you have to send the most significant bit out first. So taking third register and then uh, shifting it all out, then you have to do a clock, and then finally when it, everything's, all 24 bits are in place, then you latch it in. So if you can imagine, that is going to be a lot of shifting here. Um, so this is just like a, a, a quick call out to the shift out here uh, of what it's doing. And uh, if you notice that A, it has uh, 0x80. That's the highest bit. And, I'm, and once again, you want to do most significant bit first. So you start with 8, uh, the very highest one. And then every time you go, you just, you just keep on moving it over and over and over again. Uh, just doing an and with the value. And if that bit is set, you, you send out a high on, on pin 13. Otherwise, you send out a low. So once again, it's a lot of shifting. Um, and if you think about how fast that Go routine has to run, just so you see those digits on all the time, it's just a lot of, it's just overtaxing the, the Raspberry Pi, and it really is just a bad hardware decision as, as far as you're doing this. So to fix this, I could use some other GPIO pins on Raspberry Pi, but I thought this is a great uh, time to look at TinyGo and see what we can do there. So now TinyGo, um, I'm using a, uh, the RP2040 Pico microcontroller. Uh, the reason why I chose this is because it, it's, it's, it's supported very well uh, with TinyGo. Um, you can use I2C communications with it, and I thought since I already did that with the servo, why not also use I2C as well? And you can just do a simple build and flash routine um, or c commands to the Pico to, um, to, to flash it. Uh, this is what the, the init uh, function looks like inside for TinyGo. I just quickly put this together. I know it's not that elegant, uh, but uh, I did also wanted to use arrays for the clock and the digits. So that way, when I have this, this loop, this routine going on, I can just, uh, just, just use the, the array address instead of having to say GP0, GP1, et cetera. So now the display routine, um, I think I got a little bit, yeah. So the display routine is, uh, I actually just copied this over from the, from the Raspberry Pi and just put it inside, uh, inside TinyGo and just made some adjustments. But if you notice, it's a lot cleaner. I'm not doing a lot of shifting everywhere, obviously, because it's all, it's all just now uh, to each individual pin. Um, but I do have to do one little thing for doing the bitwise operation of taking that display value, which is going to be 0 through 9, and translating that into the bits that need to go out for the display e on each individual pin. And that's why, again, what I'm doing, instead of going from the highest bit, I'm now doing the lowest bit. A is 1, and then it's going over 1, 2, 3, 4. From the I2C side, um, this, this is another separate Go routine that runs inside TinyGo. Now, TinyGo is just Go Max Prox 1. Uh, you, can, you, you don't really have like true concurrency uh, that's happening. But when you do uh, TinyGo inside a microcontroller, as long as you're doing any type of hardware calls, uh, it will, uh, the scheduler will pick it up and run the other routine uh, as well. Um, the nice thing also with this is from the host and the controller, I can now use a message struct and uh, basically just send the, 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 uh, the message over uh, just by doing a simple serialization using binary write. And as long as the, the bits are in the same order, big endian, uh, on both sides, then it, it works great. Very efficient, very fast. So now switching from TinyGo, uh, the last, one of the last things we have to do is also taking the inputs from the playfield. Uh, so the switch handler is just another routine that's running. 
Um, and it takes all those, it takes whatever the value is that's of the switch, if it's pressed or released, and then sends it over to uh, all the observers that are inside uh, uh, on GoFlip. Um, read switch is what the, the last handler calls, and uh, it, it does do a blocking call uh, when it's doing read. So this, that's the also the reason why it's, it's also in a, a separate Go routine, so that way other uh, events can happen too. Now that we have the hardware abstraction complete, uh, there are some additional events that we need in order to implement the game itself. Um, and it's, that's mainly around the player state and uh, the game state itself. So starting off with the player state, uh, that's, it's, a, it's a simple state machine where it's either the player is up um, or is maybe they just, they just ended the, the ball uh, or they just finished the whole entire game. Uh, the game state is is very is even more simple. It's either you're in a, it's in game over or not. When the player up is called, um, this is a check to see how many players are playing first. Uh, it also allows for you to add additional players as long as you're still on ball one, and it's also going to display inside the the ball and play display what ball is is now up. Now at the very if it, it, this also will call the player start on the very very first ball. Uh, first, and then uh, it will always though call player up. So there you do have two events here that you can uh, write uh, around um, to uh, when when player up is is done. Scoring now, of course, it's a pinball machine, so scoring is a little bit important here. Uh, and uh, this is where you just call add score uh, from the from the from the game level. And you don't have to worry about which player you're telling to, to add the score. I'm just keep uh, GoFlip itself will keep track of you know who is the current player and then add the score uh, accordingly. Um, this also is a way to clear the scores as well as retrieving uh, a, a player score too. So now that we have GoFlip done, uh, now we're going to get into the actual uh, game logic. Um, this is once again Mike Bossy, the scoring machine. And the one thing that Roger told me is you want to make sure that you keep uh, if it's a simple layout then you need to have a simple rule set that people can just quickly understand. So uh, there's these little white dots everywhere uh, that, have, that I've just called spots. And the first thing we're going to do is, if you hit one of the spot targets that are lit, it's going to give you a Mike Bossy letter in the middle. Um, there is a nemesis in the game, and that's the goalie. Um, the goalie, if you do hit it, it's going to take one of the letters away in Mike Bossy, and, all, and then also light one of those white spots back up on the play field again. The, these little drop targets behind the goalie, which are extremely hard to see, by the way, because um, it's, it's tucked underneath the plastic. Um, if you spell goal, this is going to count as like a bonus multiplier inside the game. So based on the number of, of letters you have lit and how many goals that you spelled, that you get that multiplied together at the very end. Um, now, it is called Mike Bossy the Scoring Machine, and there is a Mike Bossy that's on the, on the play field. So it kind of makes sense that this would be very rewarding to, to hit this as well. So when you hit that little saucer at, at the top, uh, every single letter that you have lit, it'll give you that times 1,000 points. So the way all this works is uh, inside, out, now we're going to be inside uh, a, a separate project that's using GoFlip. And we create all these observers that, that was on the a couple slides ago. Uh, that, it, that it implements an interface. And you register all the observers into GoFlip. Uh, so the first one, I just called it the bossy observer. Uh, obviously, you can tell I'm really terrible at coming up with you know, clever names. Um, and what the, the bossy observer does first is uh, just all your basic, uh, the basic stuff, like you know, is game over? Do you start a game? Turn on the flippers, turn off the flippers, uh, turn off the game over light. Um, there's also uh, add hundreds and add thousands inside this event, and this is because if you think about it, when you play pinball and as you get 300 points, it, it normally doesn't just add 300 points to your score. You'll see it kind of increment up, like you know, 100, 200, 300. And so I have a little bit of a delay there inside a go routine, uh, and then also playing a sound for the 100 points as well as the sound for a thousand points. Um, almost every switch handler routine has at the very, very top, if not switch pressed. And that is because when the switch is pressed uh, by, or like down by the pinball, that's when you want to react. You don't want to wait until the ball to, to release the switch itself most of the time. Uh, so this, this right here just looks at what the game state is. And if the game is ended, then the only switches we will really care about is the saucer. That means the ball is stuck up there and game over. So we want to eject it so that way it goes into the apron so somebody can start a game. 
Uh, and then also the credit button at the, at the very front of the machine so you can actually start a game too. Uh, the rest of the, this, uh, the, switch uh, the switch handler is uh, just an example of like the slingshot right there. Uh, this is just uh, the, the rubber band with a solenoid on the, on the back of it. And when, the, when a ball hits it, you want to uh, fire the solenoid to push the ball away and then give 100 points. Uh, the saucer control, that's the Mike Bossy uh, little saucer at the very top. This is where uh, I'm, I'm giving a little bit of a pause just to have everybody you know, get all their excitement built up and everything like that. Um, and uh, looking at the total number of letters that was already collected, uh, and then go ahead and add uh, a thousand, or, or call the add thousands with the total number of letters. And then finally, after a second, uh, go ahead and fire the sol solenoid so that way the ball uh, gets ejected out. So the goal observer, uh, this is what manages the drop targets uh, behind. And uh, one, once again, like it's very, very hard to see, and you'll see this in a video at the very end of the machine. And uh, my, actually, when I was testing this with my brother, uh, he had a great idea of taking these blue lights at the very bottom. And if you hit like the G target, just go ahead and light up that corresponding letter. So that way, as a player, you can just look down and see which, which, letters, uh, which, which targets are hit just by looking at the indicators on the play field. Um, so also still looking at the drop targets observer. Um, we, we had 500 points. Um, we, we do keep track of all the targets for the, the player. Um, and then if all the targets were uh, uh, hit, then it's, it's going to uh, call the solenoid fire. That way it resets all the drop targets, uh, waits three seconds, adds, adds 5,000 points. Okay, now look at the shot observer. So this is those little white targets here. And the, 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 the one thing that you really need to look for on the targets is uh, to make sure that when someone hits one of the white spots, they don't just keep on rehitting that same target and getting uh, a Mike Bossy letter. So you do have to keep track of which which one is actually lit or not. Um, once again, the goalie, if you hit it, if you hit the goalie, it's gonna take away one of those uh, lit spots or uh, the Mike Bossy letters and lights the spot again. And so this is what the switch handle looks like for that. If you hit the goalie, uh, it, it will do all that and then it, it calls the add score as well. Uh, once again, going back to the, the uh, shot indicators, this is where I'm looking at to see um, which, which uh, uh, switches were hit, if the shot was lit, and if it was, it goes ahead and turns it off and then turns on the Mike Bossy uh, light uh, corresponding letter uh, again. Um, at the very, very bottom there, if all the letters are completed, if you spell Mike Bossy, there's two white, large white indicators that are not labeled. Um, and I'm just using that to just show that you completed the Mike Bossy letter bank. Uh, and then turning it all off, so that way you can spell Mike Bossy more than once uh, inside of the same ball. Okay, now looking at the goalie observer. So now the goalie is the goalie observer, not the goal observer. That's the actual moving uh, the goalie back and forth. And uh, if you if you notice here, I have green and yellow. So these are the targets, or these are the switches that I'm looking at. And based upon where the ball was hit last, is I'm going to tell the the servo to move in that location. So if one of the switches that are labeled green is hit, then the, the goal is going to start hovering more to the left of the goal. And if one of the switches are on the, on the yellow is hit, then the goal is going to be more on the right side of the goal. Just to make it a little bit more interesting, instead of just having a goalie just constantly going back and forth. Uh, so the way I did this is, once again, another large case statement. <laughs> uh, just looking at all the switches here. And I just, I just use fall through just so I can just have one uh, call for uh, setting the new position to the right side or setting the new position to the left side. Um, the actual go routine that's running for moving the goalie uh, just looks to see what is the position that's being requested. And it moves there for two seconds, and then it moves back to the center. And then it just keeps on moving back and forth uh, from that type of position. So when you start a new game, center position is the move position, so it's just constantly just going to be in the center instead of moving back and forth on the center. Okay, end of end of ball bonus. We're getting we're getting close here uh, to the very end, and uh, the end of ball bonus. This is where we're going to actually take uh, all the shots that that were hit, all the Mike Bossy letters, and figure out what is the score uh, that we had to give to the player. Now, if you notice, this is one. This is the place where I actually started using uh, a weight group here, and the reason why you need to use a weight group is because uh, there's other, all these other go routines that are running, but you don't want to have it so where the the bonus count's going down because you're you're having these 
uh, you're playing the sounds, you're, you're waiting, you're having this slow, slowly incremental score going on. You don't want to have that be going on in a go routine, and then you eject the ball and start playing a, the next ball again. You need a, uh, I'm using a wake group just to show to go flip that this, uh, this routine is still running and uh, don't want to do anything yet until it's, it's finally complete. So at the very end there, there is a wait done that's being called. Now all the other observers, uh, there's, no, there's no need to have this in player n, so inside of player n it just calls wait done. Okay, finally, the, so that's the, all the, the game observers. So there's one final thing, and that's back to that, uh, that diagnostic switch here, and it's called the diagnostic observer. And there is a separate uh, uh, method that's, that you, you, you pass this to inside GoFlip, uh, just because there's no player or game state type events that you give to the diagnostics. Um, it's a very simple uh, uh, process that, that, that just looks at you know, how many times you press that diagnostic switch. Uh, it also uses the credit button too to advance uh, uh, for, for playing the, the sp uh, certain sound if you're inside the sound test mode. Um, this is a very good way to test not just like the displays and the hardware that's going on. Um, for example, like right here, I'm just putting all ones and then uh, going up to nine and then just keep on re redoing that inside the displays. But it also allows for you to uh, test the lamps, test the sounds, as well as it will show on the display which uh, light or uh, lamp or solenoid is actually uh, being triggered. So this allows for you to even figure out like what is the constant, is your constant set correctly inside your, inside your application. Okay, now we're gonna switch over to uh, a video um, to show the game in action. That's that amazing chip tune sound. So I just hit a I just hit a draw target there, and it's very hard to see, but you can see at the very bottom how I lit the light right there.
Okay, so just wrapping up, just wrapping up the talk here. Um, I thought the observer uh, pattern worked very well uh, for implementing the game rules. It allows for uh, instead of like looking at any individual switch and figuring out like what is all the logic needs be behind that one certain switch, it allows for you to like really just program mode based instead. Uh, I think it's also very easy to troubleshoot too because going back to the when you register all those observers, you can com out, comment out every single one of them except for the one you really want to test to make sure that it's all working uh, correctly. Um, Definitely be mindful of the requirements, of your hardware requirements when you're doing software uh, interfacing. Going back to that, that example of you know, having a solenoid that's locked on. Uh, I think TinyGo has come a long way. It does have some limitations uh, still though as, as far as uh, the watchdog support. But you can get around that by just taking a, an external supervisory circuit, have that inter uh, connected to one of the pins, and then just monitor the pin itself uh, inside TinyGo. So that's, that's what my goal is after this, this, uh, this talk, is to actually take all those Arduinos and then convert them over into just using one uh, Pico with TinyGo um, and instead of using the Arduinos themselves. All right, I want to thank everybody for coming to my talk, and I wish everybody to have a rest great GoForCon 2023.